As we mentioned earlier, the global leader of the terrorist group ISIS is dead. According to top U.S. officials, Abu Ibrahim al-Hashimi al-Qawashi was targeted in a raid by U.S. special forces in northern Syria. He reportedly detonated an explosive device during this operation, which not only killed him, but six others, including his wife and children. All U.S. forces involved have returned safely. Here's Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby. They're leaderless today, um, and that's a significant blow. Uh, this is not something that we believe ISIS is going to be able to just get over real quickly and real easily. Um, that said, uh, they, uh, they are not the force that they were. Uh, in 2014, uh, as we all remember that um, uh, their growth and rapid acceleration uh, across Iraq and, and Syria, uh, th this is a uh, uh, ISIS is not the the, the the threat of the same significant nature that they were back then, but they still remain a viable threat, and we've talked about that many times. Um, that this is a group that wants to reconstitute its strength, wants to continue to attack and kill and maim and terrorize. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, Haji Abdullah was, was very much involved in trying to resuscitate the group and to grow their capabilities. CBS News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent and Moderator of Face the Nation, Margaret Brennan, is with, Margaret Brennan is with me now. So, Margaret, uh, the United States, America writ large, understandably focused a lot on Ukraine in the last few weeks or so. May it come as a surprise to some Americans, the United States military still actively engaged in ISIS-related operations. What can you tell us about this mission? And we heard John Kirby re refer to the terrorist as Haji Abdullah. I more or less butchered his full name a moment ago. Who is he and why does this operation matter? Well, if you look at the wanted poster on the State Department website, there's a long list of names, Major, that you could choose from uh, and that he used uh, over the course of his terrorist career. Um, but Haji Abdullah al Qureshi was the name that uh, was used today. Uh, he had a $10 million bounty on his head on that State Department wanted poster. What we know from the raid is largely based on what the, the Pentagon and the White House has disclosed at this point. This raid was in northwest Syria, which means there aren't a lot of reporters on the ground. Uh, and that is why there is still information being gathered. First reports often come in uh, with changed details. Some of the local organizations have said, for example, that there were a higher number of civilian casualties than the ones uh, that the U.S. US government is saying exactly how they died, et cetera, may become uh, more clear. But what we know from the raid is that this was a, a target of opportunity for the United States, that they went in and carried this out because of conditions that allowed for helicopters to go into the area. But the long and short of it is that uh, the Biden administration argues that by decapitating this terrorist organization, they have dealt a significant blow uh, to its ability to continue to operate. But al Qureshi wasn't someone who was as high profile as, as his predecessor, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who actually oversaw a so-called caliphate. Uh, and that's what uh, Kirby there, uh, the Pentagon spokesperson, was referring to when he said, you know, remember how they were. They actually controlled territory in Syria and Iraq uh, and declare, declared it a country. This is a much diminished organization because they don't have territory in a so-called government, but they are very much an international terrorist organization. And so um, killing their head up disrupts some of those operations, but it's hard to kill an idea. And so this global coalition will continue. Right now, we have about 900 um, U.S. operators on the ground in Syria and strike forces operated in nearby Iraq. And ISIS-K was involved in the bombing in Afghanistan. ISIS had recently done some operations, especially one that caught the U.S. attention in a prison in northern Syria. And that was a kind of a stepped-up right. operation that brought more tempo and more curiosity and therefore more mission-critical assessments from the U.S. True? Great points, yes. And I think that's one of the questions a lot of reporters want the answer to as well, is to get that assessment of what the reach is. ISIS-K, the organization based out of Afghanistan that has been fighting with the Taliban, the now essentially the government in Afghanistan, um, is very much deemed a threat not just to the Taliban, but potentially uh, having a reach outside the borders of that state, which parts of it do remain ungoverned. Um, and so that is something that the CIA and other organizations are trying to keep close watch on. The Biden administration argues they can do this kind of thing like you just saw them do in Syria, which is over the horizon strike that you don't have to stay on the ground and be on the ground to be able to control terror groups. This is their argument. 
And yet this was a ground operation up close, and that was riskier. Of the various options we have been communicated by the administration presented to President Biden. What do you still want to know that we still don't know about this operation and its potential consequences? Well, these are operators who flew in on those helicopters to carry this out. Uh, you're right. Um, but in terms of what more to know, getting more uh, clarity on the number of casualties, whether some of them were potentially killed in crossfire, for example, versus as uh, a result of the what the White House said was a, a suicide uh, bombing um, that that President Biden actually described today, um, that that this was taking out a family, um, how much of this was just confusion in the moment. Those are the kind of things that we often get in detail. But I think the bigger strategy that a lot of people want to know um, is what is the vision for this region? Uh, what does the Biden administration want to do in terms of keeping that footprint of those 900 operators I mentioned in Syria? Do they stay, uh, given the concerns about Iraq? And remember, every you hear every few months or every few weeks about threats to U.S. forces in Iraq uh, from Iran. So keeping this kind of footprint even nearby, not in the midst of a war zone, does carry with it risks. How committed is President Biden to doing that so that he can continue to carry out raids like this one, where you can just helicopter in and helicopter out. I think those broader strategy questions are the ones that are interesting to me. And along those lines, Margaret, broader strategy questions, yes, ISIS is there. That is of interest to the U.S., but the Assad regime is too. And there, are, there is an ongoing refugee crisis there, and there are reports that ISIS either exists within or nearby the refugee situation. The Assad regime continues. What's the plan there? I'm sure that's on your mind as well. It is, uh, very much so. Uh, we haven't heard a lot of articulation here. I mean, it's a, one of those hard problems that I think uh, policymakers would like to put aside. But uh, what we have heard from the Biden administration's, one of their top uh, Middle East advisors, Brett McGurk, um, was recently, just within the past 10 days or so, he said, uh, you know, they are committed to holding that line on not normalizing the dictator Bashar al-Assad, who, for all intents and purposes, has won a war by normalizing um, war crimes, by carrying out chemical weapons attacks against his own people, by carrying out mass murder. Uh, he's been isolated by countries like the United States. But right now, his neighbors are sort of saying, well, let's do business with him anyway. You see the United Arab Emirates, you see other countries uh, start dealing with his government again. So there's this bigger question of how much pressure are you going to continue to put there and how much is Iran in control of uh, Bashar al-Assad and his country. So all of these pieces of the puzzle matter. And I think bigger picture for the Biden administration, when they argue they put human rights first, uh, this is one of those classic examples of, well, well how far are you going to push that um, in, in terms of how much pressure you might put on people who try to normalize uh, a mass murderer? Turning to Ukraine, Margaret, today's senior administration officials told us Russia is considering a fabricated attack as a reason for invading Ukraine. What can you tell us about that and what sorts of fake operations might be under consideration? You know, Major, this is so interesting because I think what we're seeing is, you know, Russia has used disinformation as a key tactic in trying to create confusion with their, um, you know, whoever they're choosing to take on, whether it's in Ukraine or whether it's the United States. It's something that we hear often from Ukrainian officials who say, you know, social media and disinformation is something they've come to live with. This is an example of it that the United States is trying to make public to kind of take the, the air out of the balloon. Um, which is either to disrupt an operation or at least to be able to say after it happens, it's not what you say it is, Russia. Uh, the specific examples that the White House announced, and I think it's interesting, it came from the White House and not from the director of national intelligence, was specific to an example of a video that was being uh, created as propaganda to uh, show bodies, to show a, a fake attack um, that would be used to justify carrying out a military incursion so that Vladimir Putin could use his forces to say, we have to come in to stop this. Uh, and that what we are doing is not aggression, but rather 
an intervention that's necessary, coming up with a trumped up justification. Um, and so that is what the White House says they're doing this for. Um, but it's it is something that creates challenges for journalists because we don't see the underlying intelligence that's used to back it up. It's kind of a, a, a disinformation campaign that's going going um, back and forth with the credibility of the United States and the credibility of the United Kingdom being used to say, we are the ones telling you the truth. Don't believe this Russian propaganda. It's a, it's a really interesting, I think, conversation, actually. And I heard Bob Menendez, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee today, say, I'm very glad the administration declassified this information so the public can evaluate it. What do you think about that? Well, it, all we have to evaluate, though, Major, to be very honest, are, is a press release. <laughs> so right. it's kind of hard. Um, uh, so obviously, you know, you call sources, you talk to other governments, and, and, and they will say, yes, this is what our people are telling us, but this is where it gets very difficult. And that's why I'm, I'm trying to make clear to people listening that this is how we receive the information, take that into account, um, not to call it into question, but just to say we can't independently verify it. Uh, but certainly this is consistent with the Russian playbook. It is something that we've heard the administration warn about time and again, that there's a predicate for attack. And if you talk to a lot of European allies, whether it's, uh, you know, the United Kingdom or it's Finland or it's Estonia, they will tell you time and again, any kind of Russian operation is, um, so it, they sort of uh, prepare the battlefield by sowing confusion and be, by creating a reason for an invasion whether it was 2008 with the, the war with Georgia, for example. Um, this is something they do. Margaret Brennan, thank you so very much. And a programming note, you can watch Face the Nation right here on CBS News. It streams at 12 p.m. and 4 p.m. Eastern every Sunday.